Hey, you pack of bastards. Uh, I've tried to film this outside. Also, I'm testing a new mic, and this better freaking work because guess what? Nope, I thought I lost my questions, but no, they're here. This better work because I have done no testing with this mic. I have a lav mic uh, put into my wireless go, which is connected somewhere down in the nether region. And I'm mic'd up and I think this might work. I even have a neutral density filter because remember, I am a professional when it comes to filmmaking. <laughs> okay. By the way, thanks for the hat. Florida man gave me the hat. About to do a post on the Raw Society first issue of their magazine. Just about to finish this book. It's called Into the Beautiful North. It is a comedy slash real life documentary uh, with a twist on the border, Mexico, and The Magnificent Seven. Should be intriguing. It's a blast. It's a great book. Is this thing for working, focusing? Yeah, okay. Um, I've got 10 questions here and I'm leaving tomorrow, so I don't have a lot of time and that's why I'm doing another Q&A film. So, hey, you know what? If you don't like it, suck it. Okay, so I'm starting with question nine first because it came in yesterday after I did my interview with David Buto and I think it is a critically important question because it speaks to complete lack of understanding of what photojournalism is and what it means to be a photojournalist. And when I say complete lack of understanding, that is not a jab at the person who sent the question. I think it is a great question. It's incredibly important, but photojournalism and what it means to be a photojournalist, especially in the online community, is a complete mystery to people. I, I don't think anyone has idea any idea what it means to carry that title as you're working because it, you don't just pick up that title and walk into the field and say, I'm a photojournalist. So the question number one, in my interview with David Buto, he mentions he was reprimanded for reversing a negative and then printing it and submitting it to the paper. Why did he get in trouble? Okay. So what Buto mentioned is he goes to do a restaurant review. And as he's photographing from the outside in, the sign in the window is reversed because of the way he's photographing. And so in his mind, he thought, well, it's backwards. It's reading backwards. I'll just flip the negative in the enlarger and I'll make a print and submit it so the sign is in the right direction. As a photojournalist, you do not manipulate at all. That is a fireable offense. Let me repeat this for you who are dabbling in photography, who think you might know a little bit about photojournalism. To be a photojournalist requires training. You have to train, you have to be vetted, you have to get press credentials. You go into the field under the burden of journalistic ethics and let me tell you, it is no joke and they are not lightweight. When I worked at the paper, I was told, and this is when I started as an intern, this was day one. Day one at the paper was, if you make a mistake on a caption, you are fired. If you get someone's name wrong on a caption, you are fired. If you are caught doing something that is even remotely close to the ethical boundary, you are fired. If you do a restaurant review and you accept free food, you are fired. There was no wiggle room. That is what it means to be a journalist. And the reason I bring this up is that what pe most, we are so radicalized politically in America that what most people consider journalism is political theater for profit. It's not journalism. 93% of Fox voters vote Republican. 95% of MSNBC voters vote Democratic. That is political theater for profit. It is not journalism. You cannot equate that. What David did covering the Capitol building on January 6, 2021, that is photojournalism. David does not show up and say, well, I get to pick and choose the story because my political views are over here. You shoot what is in front of you. And oh, by the way, Buto in the field, me in the field as a photographer working in the journalism world as a photojournalist, I, we are the tip of the spear. That work, after it leaves the hands or the computer or the network of the photographer, goes into the hands of the editors at the paper. They are editing that work to not only refine it and make it as strong as possible, but their job is to make sure that you are not crossing those journalistic boundaries. If, you went out, if I went out and did a, a reportage story on the border and I shot it in a way that slanted the reality of what's actually happening on the border, one, that's not journalism. 
And two, the editor would immediately see that and say, one, you're either fired, or two, you gotta go back. Like you are, you're letting your opinion, your politics, the bullshit that we have so pre prevalent in our world, you're letting that consume and take over from your, re your responsibilities as a journalist. So the fact that he flipped a negative, that's enough right there. You, you just crossed a line that you cannot cross and his bosses let him know about it. So most of us, I would, I would guess that 99% of the people who watch my YouTube channel have never been photojournalists and you probably never will be. And that's fine, photojournalism is not exactly in the healthiest state. I'm not suggesting you go be a photojournalist. But to, to you, you have to understand that at, there is a level of training required to get into that field and it separates photojournalism from a lot of other genres in photography. You can waltz in and do commercial photography, you know, advertising photography. Yes, you still have to get past the barriers to entry, which are editors, art buyers, agents who are gonna look at you and say, yes, you're talented, or no, you're not there yet, or you're a complete bozo, you have no idea what you're doing, go shoot for two years and come back. You still have to get past those people, but photojournalism specifically, is critically important in my mind. And we're, uh, as I mentioned before, we are so politically radicalized that you have this subset of people who just throws reality, it's called post-truth culture in society. They just throw all of this out the window as if there's no one left on earth who has any kind of integrity or journalistic ethics and no one can tell a story because if there's anything in the story that goes against how they feel politically, then it must be manipulated, it must be faked or whatever. It's bullshit and we are suffering for this across the board. Our kids are suffering. Our education system is suffering all of it. And so that is why I wanted to lead with this question and why I think this question is so important because enough of the bullshit and enough, you, you cannot masquerade as a photojournalist. You have to get trained, you have to get vetted. And we talked about this in our, in our talk. When you had a press pass, that press pass was like gold. People looked at it and said, oh, you've, you've been trained, you've been vetted, I can trust you and they would let us in to do things and see things that you would literally say, I cannot believe you let me in here. I can't believe you're letting me photograph you doing X, Y, or Z. That's the trust that came with journalism. And the powers that be, the corrupt head, the greed heads in the world, the, the corrupt cronies in the political network, they're trying to undermine that with this post-truth ideology of saying, and this is classic dictatorship, you can never get the real truth except from anyone but me, and that's bullshit. And so photojournalists are out there and they're showing stuff that's gonna make you uncomfortable. No matter what your political views, no matter your stance on the world, no matter what your stance on climate change, whatever it is, they are gonna show you what's there. And you have to deal with the reality of what's coming back. And as a nation, I can't speak to the rest of the world, as a nation, we're kind of coming up gutless because we're having a hard time dealing with the stats and the data and the images that are coming back. And you know what? The people who are gonna suffer for it are kids, basically. Yes, I'll get off the soapbox and the public service announcement is now over. UT Austin, baby. Let's go to question number two. And this is another good one. What does an assistant do and how do you address copyright? And what I'm assuming you mean by the copyright question is if you're an assistant and you're shooting with someone else or for someone else, how does that copyright end up like if i'm assisting for joe blow editorial guy and and he says to me at the beginning of the assignment hey i can't do this by myself you're my assistant but i'd love for you to be second camera what happens um, and that's another that's a two-part double whammy question and they're both really good so an assistant does a lot of things um, depending on the size of the shoot most of the time when i was an assistant which i did for three or four years I was typically, I was, it was just me, I was the only assistant. But then when I would work on commercial shoots, there would be two assistants, sometimes three assistants, everybody had different responsibility. On a big commercial shoot, the pressure to me, what I experienced, the, the highest level of pressure on a big commercial shoot was not on the photographer, it was on first assistant. Because if anything went wrong, even if it was the photographer's fault, first assistant would get blamed. Client would yell at first assistant, photographer would yell at first assistant, that's why first assistants got paid the most. Second assistant was, all, was what I would call a hybrid role. There would be technical, photographic, logistics involved, but then also 
could be transportation, it could be shuttling equipment and moving things back and forth. First assistant is also dealing a lot with the clients themselves. And third assistant could be a gopher, it could be extraneous. I actually loved being third most. I oftentimes got, got to shoot, like second cam, third cam, or I didn't want that pressure, I didn't wanna get yelled at, and I didn't wanna do commercial work anyway. So I was there for the money, and I just didn't, I, I wasn't there to like hawk these kind of jobs later down the line. I liked working with people as an assistant who valued me as a photographer. So anybody can carry a bag of gear, but not everybody can talk to a client. Not everybody can subtly get a point across to a photographer in front of the client without the client knowing what you're talking about. So there's like almost a code involved where you could mention, you could you see something that's wrong and you can't say it because it would make the photographer potentially look bad. So you would have to basically have a, a code in what you're saying that would alert them to what you saw without the client knowing. And it was fun. And working as a second shooter was really great and the travel, and again, you learn as an assistant, you learn how these jobs come to be. It's not, it's not just miraculously they fall out of the skies. You learn about marketing. You learn how to pay your taxes. You learn how these jobs come to be. You learn who the editors are. You learn how long it takes to get paid and like sometimes what you have to do to wrangle because these big corporations don't care about the photographers. And you know, sometimes they'll, 90 days goes by and you haven't been paid. They don't care. They're making their books look good for that quarter. And so they say, hold back and don't pay any of the photographers and then wait until the next quarter and then maybe you can pay them. All of the nightmares that you, that being a photographer is, you get to learn as an assistant. So I loved it. In terms of copyright, I always retained my copyright, 100%. So I've done assisting jobs where I ended up shooting with the photographer and that work ran in editorial publications. I still own the copyright to the work and I still uh, have all those images. So I, I would never give my copyright away to work or assist with someone else. Your copyright is one of the only things of value you have and you should register all of your images by the way because when they're infringed upon, it's not if they're gonna be infringed upon, it's when you need to have legal standing. And registering is not, not uh, difficult or expensive and it's something you should do, uh, especially if you're out in the world and you're trying to actually be a photographer and you're you know doing work in the editorial corporate space or whatever. All righty then. By the way, just went for a run. Magic, heavenly here. I mean, heavenly. It's like, it was low 30s, sunny, no wind. And I just ripped. I just felt so good today for some unknown reason. Normally when, I'm, when I run, it's I basically, it's, it's whatever. Somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour of just regret. But this morning, as soon as it started, I was like, this is gonna be good. And I felt good and I just ripped. I mean, there were people lining up along the roads like, I don't even know who you are, man, but you are impressive. Not really. In my head, they were out there, naked, all of them. Okay, uh, question number three, which I've screwed up my, of course, my numbers here. I actually typed this one out, believe it or not. Uh, question number three is about the Uniball Jetstream pens. As we all know, don't be a schnook. It's not how you feel, it's how you look. Photography is about your camera <laughs> and your writing is about your pen, but cameras are, in are they're interesting and they're important because you want a camera that makes you feel like going out and shooting and some do and some don't. I've got plenty of cameras that I use. I can talk about certain brands that I used for a long time that I had no love affair with and they didn't really make me want to make photographs and I never really made great work with those brands. And then Fuji is the opposite. I love these Fuji cameras. They make me want to go make pictures. Um, that's an important thing. They're not going to change really what I'm getting unless you have breakthroughs in technology. Like I've noticed, um, I've got the 40 megapixel Fuji XH, XH2, and they both, and so this XH, XH2S, they both have this bird tracking thing. And as you know now, I'm a bird nerd. I just got two books last night in the mail Bird Vagrancy. And then this other book, I can't remember the title of, it's about like uh, tropical wetland birds. Yeah, I'm, I'm down the rabbit hole. There's no coming back from this, people. It's only gonna get worse. But these two cameras have this bird tracking feature. And I was like, what a bunch of shit. There is no way that that works. I put that thing on, I went outside, it was freezing cold, it was dark. I had my 2X converter on, which means nothing I shoot is gonna be sharp because it's, it's just too much light. I'm at like F8 or F11 shooting in the dark. And I had that thing racked out with a 2X, so your field of view is tiny. And this bird just came sideways, and all I saw was a green rectangle that just went D -d 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 tracking that bird as it went across. I was like, holy shit. 
it might actually work. So my point is that technology breakthroughs, yes, going from a five-year-old digital camera to these things, major upgrade. The pen is very similar. Some people love, I love mechanical pencils as well. Mechanical pencil, if that's what makes you create and write, use it. The Uniball Jetstream is not a super sexy pen. It's plasticky. And you look at it and you go, this can't be that good. Whoa, whoa. And then you start using it and you go, it is good. By the way, outside you're going from like full 7,000 foot bright sun, no clouds into like deep dark, it's supposed to rain. It's like full sun, it's supposed to rain in three minutes. So New Mexico weather is insane and has the best skies in the world, by the way. So anyway, back to my point, I love the Uniball Jetstream. I've burned through two or three of them so far, like burned the entire ink through, which is always a good sign. And by the way, I save all my old pens because I have an idea for something in the future that I want to do to prove my sickness and addiction level. But the Uniball Jetstream, and I use the Uniball Jetstream Sport, of course, because I'm such a sporty guy. I've actually had people describe me as a sporty guy and not in a good way. It's people who aren't sporty, who look at you and say, you're kind of sporty. Um, and it's kind of a jab because they're not and they kind of want to be, but they probably never will be. And then they look at me and they go, you've probably been sporty your whole life because you're in decent shape. And then there's a bit of resentment. And so I just let it go because I don't want them to feel bad. Okay, point number four, tips on books from Alex and Rebecca Webb. Never heard of them. Just kidding. Uh, Alex Webb. So my introduction to Alex Webb, and if you don't know, Alex Webb's magnum photographer, gringo, he's an American. Uh, done a lot of work in Latin America, a lot of work in the Caribbean, done some work in places like Turkey and, also, and actually Rochester, New York, which I will get to in a minute. And his wife is a photographer as well. I believe she is from South Dakota. And my introduction to Alex Webb was during my time at University of Texas in Austin. It appeared as if the rest of the photo department had known about Alex Webb forever, except for me. So I had friends who owned two books, Under a Grudging Sun and Half Light, Hot Light, Half Made Worlds. And, when I, and they're both like soft cover. They're not super fancy, precious object books. And when I saw those books and I saw Webb's work in two, two, two things about it, his composition and the fact that he shot in Hot Light and in what some people would refer to as Half Made Worlds or Third World Regions, I'm guessing. You know, he worked at Under Grudging Sun, is in Haiti. Um, he did a lot of work on the border. He has another book called Crossings. And he was a, a guy who composed in a way that the school, the photojournalism school, had not exposed me to someone who worked in that way. They were much more of a classic, you know, education system. Uh, the people that they presented in front of you were very, very safe, middle of the road, classic. There was no Gilles Perez, there was no Alex Webb. Um, they, for the most part, presented pretty historical, not, not to say bad photographers at all, but historical, classic, conservative photographers. So when I went to Half Price Books and I saw Telex Iran by Gilles Perez and I saw Abbas's Mexico and I saw Under a Grudging Sun, I was like, what the f is this? Changed my life. So that's why I like those two books. Um, Crossings I don't know as well, but I love the border. So any book about the border is going to be good in my mind. I love Mexico. I love uh, La gente mexicana. I love it. I love Mexican people. I love everything about Latin America. And if you don't, piss off. Get out of here. Can't have you anymore. Just kidding. Uh, okay. Rebecca Webb. Wait a second. No, let's talk about Rebecca first. The book that really put her on the map for me was My Dakota. And My Dakota, for me, was the dream book. Not, not, I didn't look at her book and say, this book is dreamy. I looked at it and said, oh, this, she knows what she's doing and this is a good book. And it was done, I want to say by Radius, which is here in Santa Fe. And they make, they're, they're just like the ultimate warrior when it comes to photo book. <laughs> so I saw My Dakota and I was like, this is solid. But it was dreamy to me because it was the kind of book that I always wanted to make. If I was going to make a book now, I would make a My Dakota book with my own story. So it's reportage. It's classic reportage, which is the same that Alex does. They've done books together, Violet Isle, and, but the one that jumps out at me is Memory City, which is about Rochester. And if I remember this correctly, and I could have this wrong, and if I'm wrong, go away. I don't want to know. I do not handle defeat well. Collapse. My inner child's in a shame spiral. Memory City was shot on Kodachrome, which is actually a black and white film. The color is inserted in the process, the K14 process. 
but they shot Kodachrome as black and white film and processed it in black and white chemistry. And the design of the book, I don't know who did Memory City, but the design, all the design of their books, even like his older, Alex's older books, Hot Light, Half Made Worlds, those are pretty simple classic essay books. The longer they got into their career to me, the more they probably, and this is likely, I don't have no idea, I've never talked to them uh, about any of this. I don't really know them well. I've met them a couple of times, but there's no like, I don't communicate with them. The understanding of what a photo book is probably changed over time. And so they get more sophisticated. You understand that making a, a, a portfolio style book is gonna approach a certain kind of audience, which is very narrow. And then if you make a book that's more than that, that combines the same imagery, but in a different way, with more copy, with more story, with better design, you're bridging outside of the photography world. Personally, with my work, I don't give a shit what photographers think. I don't give a shit what the industry thinks. I don't give a shit what editors think. I don't care, they're not my audience. I want 18 to 35 year olds who don't know what country the Panama Canal dissects. That's my audience. I wanna put my work in front of them and I know it's unlikely and I know it's fickle and I know that I'm probably never gonna get traction, but I wanna put it in front of them because I think it's the audience that would potentially benefit most. I don't care what photographers think of my work. I never have, which is probably why I was not long to be a professional photographer. Four, five, what are we at here? Let's whatever it is. I'm a full-time academic sociologist and I'm currently working on a long-term documentary project in my local area. In addition to my academic research, given my schedule, I am only able to dictate my weekends to the project and it's a bit frustrating. Do you have any tips for working around a tight schedule and shooting intermittently like this, as opposed to saying taking a month off to dedicate entirely to the project? As I've said many times before, time and access, there is no substitute. Time being first on that list, the more time you have in the field, odds are the better off you're gonna be. So I have a full-time job with Blurb. I love this job. I just wrote to a colleague 30 minutes ago about how much she wrote me about something and then we were talking about the job and about the industry and um, I had this really funny scenario happen over the weekend or no, I guess it was midweek, um, where I called someone, someone sent me an email and said, I'm trying to track a photographer who shot in Tibet in the 80s, do you know him? And I said, no, but I think I know someone who might. So I called that person and that person said, hey, do you know this other person who actually lives in Santa Fe? And I was like, what, they live in Santa Fe? I've never run into them. Yeah, so as I'm telling the first person that I had actually, I do know this guy that lives in Santa Fe because I took his workshop in 1998 and during that workshop, I met someone who convinced me to leave Kodak and shoot weddings and, as, and my phone rings and it's that person. So like everyone's connected and then I just fell over sideways out of my chair. And my wife did CPR and brought me back. So I understand how Blurb is, a, is at the moment, Blurb is not crazy busy like it was in the past. It's building and it's gonna be, but a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is on my own, even though it tangentially ties to Blurb. But Blurb is not saying go do this. I just know that it's good for Blurb and it's something I wanna do and it's all connected. But I don't get time to go in the field. I, I can't leave tomorrow and take 10 days and go to the border and work on a project. They'd be like, where the hell are you? And then uh, I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, uh, doing Excel spreadsheets. And they'd be like, no, you're not. So look for something that's a mini theme inside the project that allows you to build work quickly. And the quickest thing that I can suggest is portraiture. Portraiture is a way of shooting fast and acquiring a collective cohesive group of images in a very short amount of time. If you're like me and you shoot reality-based reportage or reality-based documentary where you're not manipulating the scene, you can go weeks, months, and not make progress on a story. And it's like banging your head against the wall, but you realize the second you start manipulating, you're not a documentary photographer anymore. But portraiture is different. Portraiture, can, you can photograph the people who are involved in the reality-based reportage, and when you enter the realm of portraiture, you can control and manipulate. So you can do a series and build themes quickly, those themes and those portraits also are a really interesting and easy way to give back to the people in the project. And then also when you do that, they often will see what you're doing because they now have concrete evidence of it in physical prints. They will open doors for you because you've just proven that you're not a looky-loo, you're not an Instagrammer, that you're really there to do a project and that you're gonna give them something tangible. They're gonna walk away with a tangible record of their experience with you. One of the things that this brings to mind is that when I came up as a photographer and even into the end, towards the end of my career, there were still quite a few people doing long form reportage projects, people-based. 
But what happened, and I saw this at Blurb. Blurb used to have a contest every year. Sorry, my 29-year-old shoe just fell off. Um, Blurb used to have a contest called Photography Book Now. The single best photo book contest I've ever seen in my life. The single best lineup of judges I've seen at any contest, whether photo or book contest, anywhere in the world in my entire life. It was an absolute badass home run of an event. I was a preliminary judge. I would look at something like 3,000 submissions of books that would come in. And then we would refine those and they would go on to an ultimate judging panel of high level book judges that we would fly in from around the world. And one thing we began to notice, and this was in the early 2000s, mid, maybe 2007, eight, around that time frame, was the dramatic shift from people-based reportage into urban abstract landscape photography. At the time, the judges were struggling with how to define this new style of work and why we were seeing hundreds of books of this same stuff, void of people, urban, abstract, but yet landscapey. Now I'm in the back of the room. I'm the lowly hack in the room because the high level group of judges is high level book people. And I'm in the back raising my hand saying, I know exactly why we're looking at this, but no one is really wanting to hear my, my, my gob spit this stuff out. But finally, because I'm a jerk, I was like, I'm going to have my say. And I said, look, I know exactly why you're seeing this. Because urban abstract landscape can be done in a short amount of time with no model releases, no human action, no location releases, no architectural releases. You just go in and blaze away. No people, no talk. Over a weekend, you can shoot an entire essay of urban abstract landscapes and never talk to another human being. And the judges were just like silent, sitting there like, hmm, didn't think about that. I know that's a fact. These urban abstract people want to move fast. They want relevance. They want immediacy. They want fame. They want fortune. They want to be known. They want galleries. They want curators. They want book deals. They want everything and they don't want to put the time in. It is a statement about our society and our culture more than it is about photography. In the words of Homer Simpson when he got his first microwave, what do you mean I got to wait 30 seconds? I want it now. That is modern photography. No one wants to bust their ass for whatever. Buto said, oh, I, I moved to DC and worked on politics for five years. You can see the collective gulp from the online photo world. You know, the, the big following people who don't seem to shoot great images, but have huge followings that are cranking stuff out. And you're like, yeah, I kind of, I know why. There, there's holes in that facade. Doing people-based, reality-based work is hard and it's time-consuming and you're gonna take your lumps. You're gonna get your ass handed to you again and again and again and you have to have the tenacity to go back out in the field and do it. And not a lot of people wanna do that because there's not really a payoff now. You get done and editors are like, who gives a shit? Like, I, I don't care what you did that, but you know what you did as a photographer. So the Alex Webbs of the world, the Rebecca Norris Webbs of the world who are still doing people-based reportage, anyone that is, Buto, doesn't matter. I know what that is. So I have an appreciation when I see a book like that that comes out, you're like, whoa. A book of portraiture to me does not have the same resonance. Urban abstract landscapes are not even in the conversation. I don't buy those books, I don't look at those books, I know what that is. And by the way, 99% of the young photographers who are doing that today, especially the young YouTube film people, they're ripping off these guys who already did this. They're ripping off the people who did it 20, 30, 40 years ago and they're not referencing them at all because their audience doesn't know they exist. So you don't need to reference them. You can just put it out there and say, yeah, I did this. And everyone's like, wow, you're amazing. The photographers who know look at it and say, yeah, but that's a copy of whatever. That's a copy of so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so and, -so. and you better keep working because it's still not as good as this work was 30 years ago. So I find it fascinating. So look for mini themes, look for things that you can build on quickly. And if you're limited with time at some point, like I'm in the same boat, as I mentioned before, there is nothing you can do. You have to work with, within the parameters of what are, are, what are given to you. Uh, next question, how do you get past a project? This was question six, roughly. Uh, how do you get past a project or move on when it's done? For some context, and this is, this is sad, but positive. For some context, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer in November, 2020. I'm sorry to hear that. She's fine now. Mm. 
and getting back to normal life. I spent the time she was sick photographing almost everything and found the photos to have real meaning. Now it's hard to photograph even though I have ideas. I keep comparing to the things I photograph now to the ones of my wife and the meaning they have. I'm at the point now of thinking about either finding more meaningful things to photograph or just accepting that not everything will hold meaning as, others, as, as other work does. Any advice on direction is welcome. Thank you. Um, not everything is going to resonate. There are plenty of what I would call burner stories, B-U-R-N-E-R, -E like a burner phone, unless you're a Republican and you've never heard of burner phones, apparently. Just kidding. Not everything is going to resonate, but the burner stories that you think may or may not have resonance to you may not have resonance at the moment, but they may very much have resonance down the line, and you just don't see it yet. You don't understand that yet. So I gave an example a couple of weeks ago. I did a film called The Parallel Project. The parallel project is this thing running along the side of the real project that you can work on at any point in case your real project derails and you're just you're frustrated and you're trying to make progress and you work on this parallel project and um, that parallel project I mentioned dogs can't read. It just sounds ridiculous when I say that. That sounds like a Wes Anderson film or Noah Baumbach film where the dialogue I'm just like shaking my head saying, did I really say that? Yes, I did a project called Dogs Can't Read. The resonance of that project was so far beyond anything I thought, and that was a total burner project. I, I, I didn't think it was anything. The viewership said, it's something. And I was like, huh? And so it took me five cities before I realized like, hey, maybe I should continue doing this. Maybe there is something here, even though it's a burner story. So, you know, your wife having cancer, that is profound. That is the day that you are given the diagnosis and your brain fast forwards to the potential outcomes and potential consequences of that statement. Anyone, your son has cancer, your daughter has cancer, you have cancer. Yeah, you immediately go to the drop down menu at the very end and say, what the hell is the outcome? Am I going to die? You know, photography typically is not entering in that realm unless you're under fire in some war zone and taking RPGs and you're about to be overrun and your special operations guy next to you hands you an M4 and says, you wanna make pictures or you wanna survive? Like that would be the only photographic equivalency of the cancer thing. So I think you're being unfair to yourself by trying to find things that resonate at that level. And I, my guess is, and I am no therapist here by any sense, but I think the diagnosis of your wife was probably so profound that it impacted you in ways that will be with you for a long, long time. And photography may be the perfect surrogate to bring you back to the positivity of the world. That's my guess. Great question. And I'm glad that she's doing well. Number seven, film enlargement size. Let's talk about size. Does it matter? Yes, it does. I would never know. It's just never been brought into question. Uh, film enlargement size from 35 millimeter and 120. So the person is asking, if I, if I process a 35 millimeter neg, what is the most likely largest print size I can get to without seeing image degradation? For me personally, the sweet spot for 35 with like Triax was 1620. That would, I like that print size in general. Uh, that's my favorite print size of all time. So 1722 on inkjet printer, but 1620 in the darkroom. It's not considered a big print these days because of digital technology. You can make wall size prints. Everybody makes wall size prints because they equate bigger print with bigger money. That's why they do it. But the beauty of a 1620 or 1722 is that even if a collector is rabid and collecting a lot, they will often have space on a wall for a 1620 as opposed to a 40 by 60, which might end up warehoused. No one sees it. They're buying it as an, as an investment. They warehouse it. Nobody sees it. 10 years later, they sell it. That person buys it. That may or may not be shown ever. A 1620 has a way of making it's making space on the wall. So I love it. And with a 35 mil, you can typically do 1620 pretty, pretty good, pretty easily. But here's the rub. A film like TMZ, I feel, prints far better in the digital space than in the analog space. So I don't like printing TMZ in the darkroom. I love printing TMZ inkjet. I love printing TMZ digital silver. I love TMZ. And by the way, if you don't know what digital silver is, Digital Silver is a company out of Boston, Massachusetts. I know the owner and his wife, they're, they're awesome. They're two of the nicest people you are ever gonna meet in the photo space. They take a, it's either a Lambda or a LightJet. These are digital laser writer printers and they print on traditional photographic paper with a red laser. And the inter you can interpolate images with no quality, no quality loss. So you can take a 35 Triax ne negative 
printed digital silver on traditional darkroom paper that runs through traditional chemistry and you can interpolate an image up with no degradation of image loss. It is absolutely astoundingly good. They are not inexpensive prints, but who cares? Because they are totally worth it. So if you're in the dark room and then uh, the follow-up question, which would be question eight, uh, is black and white tonality, warm tone, cold tone, neutral. Thoughts. Oh, I've got plenty of thoughts. There is no topic in this planet I don't have thoughts on people. Man up, woman up. Here's the thing about tone. Every single photographer I know, to some degree, is obsessed with the idea of neutral black and white. The reality that they confront unknowingly is that the general public does not care about neutral black and white. The general public responds more than anything else to warm tone black and white, whether it is magenta, purple, red, it doesn't matter. Overwhelmingly, the general population, civilians, innocents, if given a choice of neutral, warm tone, cold tone, will go warm tone 95% of the time. I hate to break it to you. They don't care about neutral black and white. The only people who do are other photographers. I get it. I print, sometimes I print and I want neutral black and white for myself for whatever reason. Most of the time I don't care. I love cold tone, love it. The public hates it. The public looks at it and goes, ugh, cold, dark, ugly, don't want it, it's blue. For some reason they hate cold tone, they love warm tone. Why do you think the, the most popular toner of all time is selenium toner? It's warm, it's warm tone, toxic as hell, toxic, extra fingers. Gill slits on your neck, if you tone too much, they will appear. You will be able to breathe underwater if you tone too much with selenium toner. It's warm, it's beautiful, it's toxic. You can't be a photographer and an environmentalist at the same time. Oh, but that's gonna rub some, that's gonna rub some, ruffle some feathers. Yeah, I just threw out a statement, something profound that I've thought a lot about. To call yourself an environmentalist and be a photographer, mm, that's called creative writing in your own brain. We can talk about that later. So yeah, I love toning. I typically, I'll either do warm tone or sometimes neutral black and white. I don't really care. It's not that important to me anymore. What's important is the quality of the image and then what it looks like in print in the book and then how that image plays with the other images and then the copy and the design and the trim size and the materials and the price point and what my goal is with it. There you go, in a nutshell. Number nine, what are we out here? 37 minutes, holy crap. <coughs> I got, the, I got the cough. We often hear and talk about the importance of intent in photography, and I get it. I try to give my work a deeper meaning through consideration of not only composition and technical aspects, but also social, cultural, and historical context. We got a thinker on our hand. What we have here is a crusader. But still, here I am looking at random snapshots. Is it possible to have, inten have an intent in not having an intent to let things happen and react instinctively through one's subconscious? Do you have images that meet that criterion? Maybe, am I gonna tell you? Of course I do. And if so, what do you do with them? Show them to other people, only close friends, nobody but yourself. Uh, do these need an explanation or should they uh, let the viewer build their own? I think this is a great question. I think sometimes, especially in a world that is so driven by public consumption of every single thing that you put out. I know photographers on Twitter who take it selfies every day. What the F are you doing? That is the most deranged thing I can think of. It screams of desperation at a level that I don't even know how to describe. Do not take selfies and post them on social media. It is embarrassing. Everyone behind your back is making fun of you. They just won't do it to your face. Don't post selfies on social media, unless they're funny. And if they're funny, even if they are funny, do it like once every month or two months or whatever. Don't do it for no reason and then make me despise every ounce of your DNA. Not everything is for public consumption. Not everything needs a book deal. Not everything needs a crowdfunding thing. Not everything is built to make you famous. Not everything is meant to build you following. Not everything is directing an arrow back at you, a giant neon arrow. You know the guy on the street that you feel bad for who's standing in the bunny costume flipping the arrow? Not all of them are pointing at you. It is absolutely critical that you do things for yourself that aren't for public consumption. It is absolutely critical that you do not share them with anyone because how the hell else are you gonna figure out who you actually are? If you're a dancing monkey, 
dance, monkey, dance like Zoolander, if you're doing that all day long for, the, for a generic global audience of people you don't even know, who the F are you? I don't even want to know you if that's what you're doing because I know it's not you. And I don't care who your facade is. I want to actually know who you are. So yes, the intent of not having an intent. 2012, I went to Panama with a photographer who had a 10 year project in Panama. So he had purpose and intent times 10. I had none. I'd never been to Panama. He had, I figured I'll just go and shoot snapshots. That was my only goal. Two Leicas, two lenses, color neg in one, tri in the other. I'll just shoot snapshots. It was awesome. I didn't have anybody saying, we need you to do this here at this time, blah, 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 all the BS of assignments and limitations and all that. I didn't have a project to work on. I didn't have a set schedule. I just looked around and was like, hey, this is kind of how I started in photography. It was a blast. If I could do that all the time, if I had enough money to quit and do that all the time, I would be doing that all the time. And guess what? Who would I show that work to? No one. Unless you somehow weaseled your way into my house, got past my perimeter laser defense, and got in here and snaked one of my books without me coming up behind you underneath your line of sight. You know, I don't know, you could get it, but that's it. Last question. Can you discuss why we don't need fancy cameras? You don't, I mean, any camera's gonna work, a light tight box that gives you, puts a lens on the front and allows you to make a picture. You don't necessarily need a fancy camera. I mean, if you are, I don't know, if there are, there are specialty applications. I guess if you worked for NASA and you were putting a camera into space and it had to do a certain thing and an infrared spectrum, and yeah, you have to have the technical aspects. National Geographic has a division inside their photography department, at least they used to, where they were problem solvers. You needed a portable handheld four by five with six, seven lenses on the front. They could build it for you. No one made that. Great, here they are. We can build this, we'll do that. That's one thing. The vast majority of people who are watching this channel right now, prosumer photographers, amateur photographers, the occasional, I don't know, lost pro, maybe they're hammered, they've woken up with their YouTube channel on. They don't, we don't necessarily need the world's best, fanciest, greatest stuff. You know, the cameras that I just mentioned I bought, they do so much more than I'm ever gonna do with these cameras. I still don't understand things like when it comes to filmmaking, F-Log and F-Log 2 and Apple ProRes, I have no clue what any of that means, zero. I put it on 1080, I hit the autofocus and I hit play and I start recording. I don't care. Do I need this camera? In some ways, yes, because I need a camera that will perform for me and for Blurb and for my future self and future Blurb self, which I can't entirely define at the moment because it's changing. They're gonna ask new things of me. I have to have something that will keep up. The other camera has high megapixel count, and the reason I got that is for birding. I told you, I'm down the rabbit hole. I need, some, I need big files. If I'm gonna impress these other birders from around the world, and that's my primary goal, I wanna talk shit. I wanna end up at these remote bird camps and come strutting in in my tank top and my camera around my neck and say, who's here for second place? Because first place is already locked up, losers. If I need, I need some megapixel count. And the 24, my old camera, I could see the image degradation because I went to Mexico and my buddy had a full frame something, Canon. We shot the same Kestrel on top of a, uh, whatever it was, cactus on an island in the Sea of Cortez. Sounds romantic, cause it was. And I looked at his file and I was like, holy shit. That just took my file over its knee and just cracked its spine. You know, tossed it in the dust and left it there. So I was like, I need to man up. I need to, I need to get a bigger, better, more modern camera so I can stomp my friend. It's what it's all about, people. Uh, and that's our Q&A for today. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I will be back sometime, I don't know, in the future with something else, maybe. Um, I've got a cycling film I'm working on because now I have 4K 120 slow-mo. So get out of my way, people, because it's all going to be cinematic bliss from here on out. Later.